What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and this is another episode in the As Yet Unnamed series where we talk about recent tournament lists that were particularly cool or notable. I asked for some suggestions on names in the last video. I think my favorite so far is Tactical Tortoise Tournament Tech Talk. I like that one a lot because at the start of every video, I can say, welcome to my Tech Talk. Let me know down in the comments what you think, and if you have a suggestion for the name of the series, drop it down there. Also, give a like and a subscribe while you're on your way down if you like this style of video. Today, we're going to be talking about some Black Templars. And as always in this series, we're going to go over an overview of the tournament in question. In this case, the Du Bois tournament that took place last weekend. The list that won the event, as well as all of the opponents that the list played. So we can track its path to victory and see exactly what makes it tick. I think it's appropriate today that we're talking about Black Templars because we're doing Black Templars for this month's channel giveaway. I'll put a link down in the pinned comment of the video if you want to join the giveaway. I'm giving away two Black Templars army starter box sets to two lucky viewers so go check that out and also if you want some additional chances to win you can always check out tactical tortoise on patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise you're automatically entered for free entries so your chances to win are effectively doubled but anyway let's get into it and talk about this winning black templars list the event in question is du bois gt which took place starting on november 13th in henrietta new york this is a relatively large event featuring both an age of sigmar tournament as well as a warhammer 40k tournament and painting competition the faction breakdown for the 40k event was relatively interesting as well we had nine space marine players which is generally to be expected because space marines are typically well represented in events interestingly three of those were ultramarines players which kind of caught me off guard but other well represented factions were Death Guard and Adeptus Sororitas. This event was before the November rebalance data slate, so it was not using the newly rebalanced versions of Orcs, Adeptus Mechanicus, or Drakari. So it's interesting to see that both Orcs and Adeptus Mechanicus were relatively low in terms of player count. We did see six Drakari, but the prevalence of those Death Guard and Sororitas, as well as obviously Grey Knights up in there, I think are indicative of a changing metagame, where those two factions probably have a much better matchup into those powerful Grey Knights that can keep some of the other super powerful factions in the metagame down. While I don't think that without any changes, Adeptus Mechanicus or Orcs would ever have stopped being very well represented and doing extremely well in tournaments, I do think that a faction like Grey Knights that approaches combat in the game so differently than other factions does throw a wrench in their game plan, and especially for Drukhari, because that Drukhari versus Grey Knight matchup is very bad for the poor pointy-eared elves. We also saw a smattering of other factions, mostly a pretty healthy spread, including three out of Thousand Sons Imperial Knights, Adeptus Custodius, Necrons, and Tyranids, with some showcases from Mixed Eldari, Harlequins, Forces of the Hive Mind, and a couple Chaos Space Marines as well. Overall, pretty good, and I'm hoping that we see this well distributed a metagame in the future. That glut of a Death Guard and Adeptus Sororitas, I think, is a little bit of an outlier and definitely changes the tenor of this event. It'll be interesting to see if that happens in the future. I do think those factions get a lot more powerful if we see a drop off of factions like Orcs or Adeptus Mechanicus, but we'll have to see. Now, recently, I did do a live stream where I reviewed the Black Templars Codex and all of the cool and interesting pieces of technology therein. And it's cool to see that I do think a lot of the archetypes and particular strengths of that supplement that we talked about in that video are being represented in this winning list. This is Kevin Roach's Black Templars list, and it is bringing some different stuff. It's led by High Marshal Hellbrex as well as a Primaris Chaplain on a bike. Interestingly, it also has Chaplain Grimaldus in the list, who I wasn't really sure would see much play, but obviously in a multi-redemptor style of list, Grimaldus does have that ability to pass out a 6 plus damage ignore roll to everything, making those Redemptor Dreadnoughts very difficult to kill, especially alongside the Stalwart effect and 5 plus invulnerable save that you can get from Uphold the Honor of the Emperor. This actually makes Black Templars a little idiosyncratically one of the best Redemptor Dreadnought sub-factions in Space Marines and almost one of the best chapters to run vehicles at all, since one of the big downsides of those Space Marine vehicles is that they're often lacking that invulnerable save to keep them safe from high damage anti-tank weapons. Uphold the Honor of the Emperor obviously gives the entire army that five plus invulnerable save, and the downside of not being able to receive cover doesn't really matter so much for those Redemptor Dreadnoughts. If you stack that on top of Litany of the Divine Protection from Chaplain Grimaldus, as well as his own aura of a six plus damage ignore roll, you basically get an Iron Hands level of survivability out of those Redemptor Dreadnoughts, and you can make the core brick of the army extremely difficult to chew through. Redemptor Dreadnoughts themselves with their very flexible 
swath of attacks being able to fire both heavy anti-tank shots out of their macroplasma incinerators, as well as having a swath of anti-infantry attacks out of their storm bolters and onslaught gatling cannons are a very flexible and well-rounded core to any space marine army. Also with that duty eternal built in being a dreadnought, they are relatively difficult to kill. The biggest downside being that they don't have that invulnerable save. Being able to give them that invulnerable save on a stick alongside the damage ignore is super good and definitely shapes a lot of Black Templars lists. Now, the Primaris Chaplain on a bike, I think, is also interesting to talk about. This guy is a combo that we talked about a little bit when we went over the faction in, in my review video. He's running Tannhausus Bones, which is a relic that reduces the damage value of all attacks attacking the Primaris Chaplain to one. In addition to the Iron Resolve Warlord trait, which is a Warlord trait out of the core Space Marine Codex, giving the Chaplain plus one wound as well as a six plus damage ignore roll. That means this Primaris Chaplain is coming out with obviously his four plus invulnerable save thanks to his Rosarius. Eight wounds with all attacks only dealing one damage to him, meaning you have to attack him eight times to actually kill him. One sixth of those he will ignore thanks to that Iron Resolve Warlord trait. This guy is stupid hard to kill. The downside, obviously, is that this Primaris Chaplain, if you're bringing him alongside Grimaldus, cannot be a Master of Sanctity. So he's just going to use his regular Litany mechanic, trying to get one Litany off on a 3+. Now, obviously, you can use Commanding Oratory or the Black Templar specific stratagem, Bombastic Delivery, to automatically pass that Litany. And with Canticle of Hate, that means this Primaris Chaplain, in addition to being an absolute tank by himself, is also basically a 2 CP plus 2 to charge buff on a stick. That's supporting three Primaris Crusader squads, each one 10 models, bringing five initiates as well as five Primaris neophytes. I like that the Sword Brothers in each of these Crusader squads have their own little upgrades. One of them just running a regular power sword, but one of them is running a Pyre Pistol and one of them with the Sword of Judgment, the upgraded power sword relic. These squads are relatively beefy, especially once you start adding additional protection on top of them, such as the Aurelian Shroud being held by the List Judiciar, giving all 30 of these models a four plus invulnerable save for one turn whenever you need it. I like the idea of having nine Primaris bodies protecting a Sword Brother who's been upgraded to deal the maximum amount of damage. It really just adds a little packet of melee damage into these units, which in addition to having a pretty high attack volume themselves, all of them bringing Astartes Chain Swords for a pretty reasonable number of attacks, means that you're able to deliver these little objective secured Sword Brethren bombs to your opponent. Obviously following that up in the Elite slot, we do have that Judiciar as well as the Redemptor Dreadnoughts we talked about, one unit of Servitors to perform actions, as well as a unit of Vanguard. Vanguard veterans. Unlike the normal Vanguard veteran unit that we see bringing lightning claws, this one's actually elected to take all thunder hammers, alongside upgrading the Vanguard veteran sergeant to a champion of the feast. This bumps up that veteran sergeant with an additional wound and attack, as well as making him weapon skill two. That means that the downside of the thunder hammers giving minus one to hit doesn't affect the veteran sergeant quite as much, given that he's going to be hitting on threes rather than twos. Given that he's now going to be hitting on threes rather than just fours like the rest of his unit. This unit also is taking the icon of Hindman to ignore AP one and AP two on one model in the unit. Given that it doesn't have an apothecary, I don't know which model has that, but I imagine it's not the champion. Since you have to allocate the wounds to the model with the icon in order to get that defensive benefit, putting wounds on the champion of the feast means you're going to lose him early and you don't have a way to resurrect him. That means that if you are taking those low to mid AP shots early, you could accidentally lose that model and lose your most powerful hitter in the unit. Rounding out the list, we have one unit of three eradicators with a heavy melta rifle. Overall, I think a pretty straightforward Black Templars list. I do like the core of Redemptor Dreadnoughts, especially being protected by that Judiciar. It kind of gives the list a bit of a Space Wolves flair, where it's very difficult to engage profitably into that core of Dreadnoughts. Not only are they very difficult to kill, potentially with a 5 plus invulnerable save, 5 plus damage ignore roll, and a 6 plus damage ignore roll on the other two that haven't been targeted by Litany of Divine Protection. There's also interesting synergy between the Judiciar and Devout Push, since you can stack your Devout Push before the Judiciar's ability activates, meaning he can devout push into range to force enemies to fight last. This means that even trying to engage into that core in melee is not going to be so easy, given that you're going to have to fight around that fight last effect. Just as a little bit of a side note so that nobody misunderstands me, this combo is mostly going to be used more offensively since both Devout Push and the Tempora Mortis ability on the Judiciary trigger at the same time. If you use it in your opponent's turn, so for example, when they're charging into your Redemptor Dreadnoughts, they can actually force you to sequence the Tempora Mortis trigger before the Devout Push happens, so you actually wouldn't be able to move before you pick the unit to fight last. But if you're using it on your own turn, you can use that Devout Push to move that Judiciary through 
three inches, either with that three inch normal move or the pile in to get some additional targets to hit with a temporal mortis. Just wanted to make sure everybody knows the actual interaction just in case there's any confusion. The three 10 man crusader squads also give the list a lot of objective secured bodies to put in the center of the table and alongside that really domineering control that black templars have over the mid board and over primary objective scoring, especially because of that devout push to get additional models onto objectives when you need them to. This makes it very easy for black templars to score big on primary objectives as long as they can get those objective secured bodies at the table. Even without rights of the war in the list, the core models that don't have objective secured can easily be given objective secured in the black templars command phase for one CP using strength of conviction, meaning that it's even going to be difficult to take objectives away from those redemptor dreadnoughts. Being able to, in your opponent's fight phase, for example, devout push the dreadnought onto an objective, then when it comes back to the Black Templar's turn, give it objective secured to steal it away from your opponent is a pretty neat combo that not a lot of armies have very good play against. In addition, being a pretty new chapter, a lot of these Black Templar's tricks are just unknown by the metagame. And it definitely may be that Kevin was able to make use of some of these super technical plays when his opponents weren't expecting them. And speaking of opponents, let's move on from talking about the list and talk about the players that Kevin played against. Now, each of the missions for the event was posted in their event packet, so we're going to be able to talk about the mission in particular. I was told that this event was live streamed, but I actually couldn't find VODs of the live stream anywhere. If anyone knows where those are, you can go ahead and post it down in the comment section down below so we can all go watch them. But as it stands, I actually wasn't able to watch any of these games in particular. In the first round, Kevin was paired up against Tyler playing Adeptus Custodes. This is a relatively standard Adeptus Custodes build, featuring two Telamon Dreadnoughts as well as one unit of Alaris Custodians, backed up by three units of Sagittarium, one big Custodian Guard Squad, as well as a Shield Captain Undaunt Eagle and Trajan Valoris to give some rerolls to those Sagittarium units. With the relatively low model count of the Adeptus Custodes army, I imagine that Kevin was going to be able to flood the midboard of the table with those 30 Crusaders and make it very difficult for those Custodes to get a foothold in the two center objectives on battle lines. This makes it very easy to lock your opponent down to only a five point primary turn every round and win big yourself on primary. This ended up being a 100 to 38 point win for Kevin, which is a pretty strong start to the event. Round two, Kevin was paired up against my favorite buggy boys over here, a Tyranid list, this time run by Cory, bringing a single Leviathan battalion led by a Hive Tyrant as well as the Swarmlord and a Tyranid Prime, and focusing heavily on Tyranid Warriors, with one big melee unit as well as one big range unit running Death Spitters and Venom Cannons, both of them upgraded to have enhanced resistance. We do see the Hive Guard unit backed up by a Maliceptor as well as the Swarm Leader Warlord trait to give them rerolls, which means that Hive Guard unit, even through the defensive buffs that they Black Templars can put onto their Redemptor Dreadnoughts can potentially knock them out. That reroll damage on the D3 damage weapons means that a lot of the time you're going to be getting two damage shots through those Redemptors and at only AP2, them having an invulnerable save isn't the end of the world. The downside of this tiered list is that this focus on Warriors makes it relatively pillow fisted. While the Warriors are a pretty good ranged unit and have a lot of access to bonuses to hit, once they break cover, they can get knocked out by heavy anti-tank weaponry like those Macroplasma weapons or even heavy melee like Thunder Hammers once they get into Assault Doctrine. This round was also played on Vital Intelligence, which very heavily favors the player going first, makes it very difficult to win going second, and Kevin was able to pull this game out with another 100-point victory, scoring 100 to Corey's 26. This is a score that's indicative of a player going first on Vital Intelligence, since you're able, especially with those big Crusader squads, to put yourself in a position to lock in a lot of the central objectives of the mission early and force your opponent to move into your dangerous threat ranges, or else they lose heavily on primary. One of the reasons that I don't really like Vital Intelligence for competitive play. Moving to round three, Kevin was paired against Drukari. We're moving a little bit up in the metagame here, this time versus Steven, and this time on Priority Targets. Priority targets actually is a little bit beneficial for Space Marines, especially against Drakari, since you can play relatively defensively and don't necessarily have to move into their melee ranges. Drakari tend to be able to knock out a lot of Space Marine units very quickly if they're able to get to grips with them. But if you're able to sit back for a little bit and spend a couple rounds shooting or positioning before you have to get in, you can use those Redemptor Dreadnoughts to soften up a lot of that Drakari army. In addition, giving all of your Redemptor Dreadnoughts a 5 plus and vulnerable save against weapons like Dark Lances is a pretty big deal. Stephen's List was a relatively standard triple patrol archetype out of Drukhari, bringing Prophet of Flesh Detachment as well as a Cabal of the Black Heart Detachment. We have Drazar in there, so we can use Incubi to be wounding most of that Space Marine infantry on twos, which means Uphold the Honor of the Emperor comes into play with that Stalwart effect, forcing them to wound on threes. That's backed up by a ton of Raiders as well as a Cult of Strife Detachment, bringing some Smash Succubi as well as Hecatrix Blood Brides and a big unit of 10 Hellions. 
The relatively balanced nature of priority targets came into play here, and the scores were a lot closer than Kevin's other games. This time, Kevin was able to take it down 100 to 53. So we're going up in the world, but not a particularly close game for the Black Templars. This one would have been an interesting one to see. I imagine that the Black Templars were able to hold control of the center of the table using their ranged attacks to knock out the faster, more contesty elements of the Drakari army so they weren't able to get a foothold on primary, and basically just use that and heightened resilience of the Black Templars as well as their control over both the fight phase and primary objective scoring in order to keep the Drukari on the back foot. And that put Kevin on into the semifinals in round four against Matthew, who was playing Death Guard. Now, unfortunately for Death Guard, this mission was on Overrun, a six objective mission that tends to be relatively difficult for Death Guard. While Death Guard are able to mix it up in the center of the table pretty effectively, unfortunately, they don't move very quickly. And while Matthew's list did have two fetid blight drones, which are some of the faster units in the Death Guard arsenal, they aren't quite fast enough, especially after they get shot to death by Redemptor Dreadnoughts. Using effects like a devout push to move his models around as well as get models onto primary objectives without having to engage into units like Death Shroud Terminators was, I'm sure, a big deal in this matchup and was able to give Kevin another extremely one-sided win, this time 98 to 27. Kevin did drop two points here, maybe from an engage in all fronts or something along the way, but with Overrun's domination mechanic requiring you to hold two objectives in order to score five points, I imagine that he was pretty often able to get some Crusader squads into several objectives on the Death Guard side of the table, dropped it down to one objective and only five victory points around. And that moved Kevin on into the finals, this time against Adeptus Mechanicus, the hated foe of the metagame currently. Now, in fairness to Black Templars, we have been talking about their resilience pretty often, and the devastating ranged alpha strike that Adeptus Mechanicus is able to pump out isn't the end of the world for an army like Black Templars. That can give all of their infantry a 4-plus and vulnerable save and fall back on those 5-plus and vulnerable saves and 6-plus damage ignore rolls to hopefully keep the rest of the army alive. With some very defensive positioning, this can mean that you don't lose too much on the first round of shooting. Now, this was a bit of an interesting Adeptus Mechanicus list, not something that we typically see. I did talk about Adeptus Mechanicus in another video earlier this week, so if you want to hear me talk at length about all of the interesting and intricate combos that a list like this brings to the table, you can go check that video out bringing a Skatari veteran cohort with a grand total with a grand total of 80 Skatari infantry as well as one big unit of vanguards two big units of rangers as well and a couple smaller units to perform actions and grab objectives a couple Sakarian infiltrators as well as three individual iron strider balistarii where things get spicy is the fact that we see archaeopter fuselovs in place of stratoraptors in this admech list so focusing a little bit more on mortal wounds which interestingly which the warded effect in the black templars chapter tactic actually comes into play against we also see three onager Doom Crawlers, not something that we typically see in that heavy support role. They do trade pretty heavily with a big heavy anti-tank weapon for relatively low cost, but the fact that their weapon profiles are pretty unpredictable means that you don't typically see onagers at top tables of events. This matchup was on Surround and Destroy, a mission that can favor the player going first relatively heavily just because it has a shallow deployment zone and you're able to get a good engagement across the breadth of an enemy army, meaning that stopping things like solar flares from dropping enormous Katari bricks in your face and blowing up your Redemptor Dreadnoughts and stuff is very difficult. That said, Kevin was still able to take it down 93 to 71. That put Kevin in first place with a grand total of 491 battle points. He dropped a total of nine points over the course of five games, and in my opinion, are very indicative of how powerful Black Templar's control over primary objective scoring is. The ability to give yourself objective secured in the command phase anywhere you want on the table, meaning that even your Vanguard veterans or your faster units are can be stealing objectives away from people, and the ability to move in potentially your opponent's fight phase to steal their objective is also a very big deal. Now, it is important to mention that the second place player was Brad Chester bringing Grey Knights, who did score over the course of five games 490 points, only losing out on a tie for first place by one battle point over the course of five games. Neck and neck race. One thing that's interesting about the top standings of this event are that a lot of the best performing factions and really the best performing factions moving forward in the metagame are ones that do require some level of finesse. I mentioned it before, but I think it's important to say again, this Black Templar's army does require a lot of technical play and really heads up play to be able to 
position yourself to take objectives and respond effectively to your opponent trying to contest your primary objective scoring. Grey Knights are a little bit similar with an immense amount of maneuverability, meaning that they have to be able to use intricate combos of psychic powers as well as their abilities to teleport around the table effectively. They are a little bit more straightforward in that they typically score high simply because of Purifying Ritual. Although we haven't seen any errata to their codex yet, I imagine that that's probably first on the chopping block if we do see any changes. But also at the top of this particular event, Thousand Sons and Emperor's Children, as well as a couple Death Guard, with Drukari and Adeptus Mechanicus being relegated down to 7th and 8th place, respectively. It's my sincere hope that events moving on into the future, especially since those super powerful armies have received a little bit of a tone down, look a lot more like this, with a wide distribution of interesting armies both submitted at the start of the event and in those top placings at the end. But anyway, that's all I have to say about this Black Templars army that won Du Bois GT. Hopefully we see Black Templars doing well in the future. They've kind of hit the ground running a little bit since their supplement was just released and they're already starting to win events. Like I said before, they're a very tricksy and interesting Space Marine chapter, not just one that kind of sits there and shoots grav cannons at you or Volkite Contemptors. They do have to play more of an aggressive primary objective focused game, but they are super good at doing that. And in the hands of a good player, I think are gonna be very, very strong. I wanna thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. Big thanks as well to everyone who supports the channel, both on Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise, as well as over on YouTube with the YouTube channel members and Twitch subscribers. All you people are awesome. I really appreciate you. Remember to keep it classy folks and have happy wargaming.